All right, we are live. This is SAS Bytes, your weekly bite of SAS during your lunch break. Uh, this is episode 68. So we're starting to get up there in numbers. I uh, appreciate everyone coming back uh, for this series. What we're doing is uh, going through um, and talking about front-end architecture and uh, getting a chance to talk about what front-end architecture is and also what front-end architects do. And in that process, we're getting a chance to uh, interview some of the people out there that are doing front-end architecture, whether that's their official title or it's just a title that they're working for, like myself. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a lot of people out there that um, have kind of... Um, uh, gravitated to this the whole concept of architecture because realizing that that what they're doing is is the planning part of, of front end. Um, this this last week we had some discussions as we're kind of changing some of our processes internally, and we're starting to talk about like experience, architecture, and ops. And I started to realize that front end architecture is kind of the planning, front end experience maybe is the doing. We're actually creating the things that people consume, and then front end ops is the serving. So maybe that's my next blog post or something. But uh, we're kind of seeing uh, the architecture is that planning phase of, of let's talk about how this whole thing is gonna, going to get built um, so we can do that smoothly um, as it gets going. So today we have an architect on our uh, show and I'm really excited to have Welch Canavan on the show. He is a front-end architect, uh, front-end engineer, front-end whatever his business card says at the moment, but he's really an architect uh, for National Geographic. Um, I actually got a chance to meet him uh, out in D.C. this last year. He is a co-organizer of Sassy D.C., um, and I was going out there to uh, visit the Phase 2 offices, and I was like, hey, Sassy D.C. people, let's get together for dinner. So uh, a bunch of people showed up. We had Thai food. It was awesome. Welch was one of those. So uh, happy to um, have him on the show. Welch, how's it going, man? Hey, it's going really good. I'm happy to be here. I'm looking forward to it. I'm certainly glad you're able to uh, to catch us. We we planned the show a couple uh, uh, last month of January, and then I got deathly sick, and um, I'm almost over that sickness. Oh, I was going to say, you sound better. <laughs> Most of the sneezing's gone. Some of the coughing's still there, but we'll see how this whole thing goes. So appreciate you being on the reschedule and come back on the show. So um, what we like to do to uh, for, for all of our guests is the first question we ask, um, when is the first time that you realize that you'd moved from just being a developer, not just because developers are still great, but moved from being a developer to like starting to do and be interested and be obsessed with the architecture of a project? When, when was that kind of moment for you? Um, well, interestingly enough, I think that I maybe came at it a little bit backwards from a lot of other people. Um, you know, aside from, uh, uh, I did a lot of tinkering with websites, you know, since I've been in high school and i built a lot of websites, mainly as a hobby. Um, but then I, I ran into Rob Wurzbowski in Pittsburgh, and he showed me this thing called SAS, which I thought was really interesting. Um, see, my first web job uh, was actually as a systems administrator. Um, so I did a lot of stuff with setting up Linux and really the back end of things. Uh, so when he showed me SAS, you know, I'd, I'd always thought of the website part as kind of just like a, a hobby. But then that was the first thing where I was like, Oh, this is neat, you know, and it wasn't challenging, or it wasn't it wasn't scary to me at all because I was really used to being in the command line. Um, so I think uh, pretty early in my career, I actually had a, a greater level of comfort with uh, build tools than I did with even kind of advanced front end architecture, um, just because of that experience I had, that professional experience I had in the command line. Nice. Um, so basically, you came into it wanting to have that structure, wanting to have that architecture and basically assuming it should be there in the first place. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and, and I think the reason that I still, you know, that I never became like a full-on back-end, archi- uh, back-end engineer or even full-stack is that I'm really drawn to the, the more human element, you know, the, 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 the part of an application that people actually interact with. Um, but I still recognize that that's, you know, it, it serves people, but it's also a piece of software, and it should be as well-built as possible. That's that's funny because we we've kind of talked about this on the show and uh, and off show also how for us for talking about front end architecture is like oh this part of the web needs the kind of structure and and love and dedication and focus that all these other parts have and have already had and had for so long um, and and I think it, it takes people like that who are like wait why 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 don't we have this what are we doing why would you not of course you do this uh, that instead of just like, oh, we'll just, I just want to design things. I'm sorry, that was not meant to be an insult against designers. I just, like, 
that you care about that as a, a focus, really. Yeah. So yeah, coming in with with that kind of mindset is definitely uh, it's good to have all those different directions. We have a lot of people coming to front end, coming from design. A lot of people coming in from more of just a you know programming CSS background, and then you also have people coming in from more of systems where you're expecting that kind of system uh, approach. So it's it's neat to see it, it, it takes all sorts of flavors to, uh, to to get into the architectural portion of it. So can you can you talk to us about the work that you do at National Geographic? Because certainly it's a huge organization with uh, I'm sure tons of web properties. So what what part do you play, and and what can you tell us about uh, the the web process in the organization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, it's hard to talk about what I do at National Geographic without talking about National Geographic a little bit. Um, a lot of you people can talk about that all you want. I think that's super interesting, and I want to know how you get a job at National Geographic because that sounds really cool. <laughs> um, yeah, honestly, you know, it's 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 the it's the job I never dreamed I would get. You know, as a little kid, I loved that magazine more than anything else. So I was really happy when the opportunity came my way. Um, uh, I believe we are doing some hiring in the next year, so uh, the way to look at uh, the way to get a job in NatGeo is to look at our jobs board. Uh, um, but uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, a lot of people's primary association with National Geographic is going to be the magazine and the channel. Um, but the reality is, we actually do an incredible amount of different things. Uh, you know, we we sell tickets to live events. We have uh, trips that you can book to go visit the Grand Canyon or foreign countries. Uh, I, I, think, I believe in this year we're rolling out lodges that you can rent from us. And then we also have things like applications. We have uh, uh, one application called Your Shot, um, which is a kind of photo sharing uh, application that allows you in to interact with National Geographic photographers and get assignments from National Geographic photographers. So, so basically um, your Airbnb, Snapchat, and... Yeah. <laughs> It's crazy. I mean, and that's not even all of it. I mean, basically, uh, so, uh, a guy I work with, really smart guy I work with, named Chris Combs, recently did a profile of all the different services we have, and it's uh, it's actually hundreds of sites. And we're we're looking at really uh, reining some of that in, but we have a little bit of everything. You know, it, we have uh, we're definitely strongest in Django and different variations of Django. But then we started making some sites with uh, Adobe Experience Manager, which you may also know as CQ5. Uh, we have some sites that are built as Angular applications, Backbone applications. We have some WordPress. And then when he did this whole uh, profile of all our things, we were like, whoa, we've got one Drupal site. Look at that. You know, so it's really we've got just about everything, um, which means that uh, uh, you know the tools that we build actually have uh, a few unique challenges. Um, maybe not unique, but uh, when we're talking about living style guides, a lot of time we're talking about uh, building out a style guide for a singular site or application or a suite of applications. Um, and what's interesting here is when we started talking about building this style guide, it's, it's, the, it's that we had to build something really bulletproof that could live just about anywhere. So what, what kind of work is it that you do specifically um, at National Geographic? Um, I've done a little bit of everything. Uh, I, brought, I was brought in to do a redesign of the magazine. That's what I was uh, originally brought on the team to do. Um, and then I worked for a little bit uh, doing the kind of long-form animated story articles. And now I work on what's called the System Tools team. And basically, we we uh, basically work on internal tools uh, that get distributed to all these different properties. Um, and part of that is you know making sure our video player works everywhere, making sure our member registration works everywhere, um, and then also part of that is uh, uh, bringing these uh, bringing consistency to our user interface and user experience. Nice. So um, we know. Uh, you so you've done a lot of work with National Geographic, and there's and I seriously cannot say the word geographic today. Sorry, my nose is bugged up. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like me to do it? Twice now. <laughs> Here, I'll I'll take over. You've done a lot of work with National Geographic, <laughs> uh, but but you definitely have some other uh, work out there that's become really popular, particularly the Style Guide Roundup. We wanted to kind of talk a little bit about that with you. Um, obviously, like you say in the post, it's 
not a new idea, but it's becoming really popular now with SaaS and all the tools that we have. What led to you kind of writing that, building that, um, the roundup, you know, where you find all your uh, resources? And um, well, honestly, what led to that is I have a really great boss, and when and when we uh, uh, he basically freed me up to kind of pursue the idea of living style guide, to pursue the idea of what mortar has become, um, and uh, I am just a. a, a when I, when I find a rabbit hole, I tend to go deep down it. And so I, I wanted to actually try a bunch out and take them for a spin. So I basically tried building mortar starting out in each of those systems just to kind of see what the pros and cons were. Uh, and then I wrote up my findings basically because it's the article that I wish existed when I started my, uh, uh, my journey because I probably could have skipped the journey part. Yeah, right. We did a lot oh, of that sure. same research. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure it helped a lot of other people that, that did that same journey because I think that's I think that's how I found Hologram, or at least one of the resources that I came across when I made the decision to pursue that. Um, how much time did you spend with with each of them? Was it a couple hours or like a couple days on each one? You know, probably a half day to a day on each one. I don't I don't think I spent a full day on every one of them. You know, I, I know I certainly spent a day on. Um, Oh, I'm blanking the one that uh, Sam Richards built. Um, uh, north. Or the. It was, it was pretty north. Um, Singular. Oh no, that's. He's not. gonna kill me for that. Style yeah. prototype. Style prototype. Yes. Uh, I spent a day on that one just because there's a lot to learn from that. Honestly, mm -hmm. even just even just running the the Yeoman generator on that. Um, he's a very very smart guy, and the way that he has. Uh, everything architected, you can learn a lot from it. So that's probably the one I spent the most time with. So you say in your post, obviously, you, you said you built Mortar kind of based on Hologram. Um, was that just the most similar to kind of what you needed, or what was the the real, um, like, the reason you went with Hologram? I, I, I like doing things the way that I like doing them, and that's why I liked Hologram, because it really gets out of the way and mm -hmm. lets me do it pretty much lets you do more, more or less exactly what you want to do. Uh, I think in the time since I wrote that article, I think the one weakness I found uh, is the auto-generation of the uh, table of contents. Um, it's not strong because it doesn't really do well with children. Um, but uh, A, I'm sure it's fixable somehow, um, and B, it's really it's not a, a make-or-break kind of problem. That's so funny that you said that because we have um, we have a thing that we've written ourselves and we have the same thing. It just automatically pulls in all of your uh, partials and like all the template partials. And so I'm breaking stuff out now into like the clear fix and I'm like I don't. There's no HTML. There's no template and it's getting a little bit strange. So we it's a pretty common I think. Now are you using? Are you using um, uh, hologram as well? No, we we wrote our own. Um, oh, cool. Or we have started writing a thing. And the so vault, are you? you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> out of curiosity, what drove you to uh, write your own as opposed to use one of the? the so, mini so we had done we had done kind of the the same research, and the two things that were different for us, or uh, not like we're probably the only people that have have this uh, issue, but uh, we want to eventually serve templates as well. Um, so some bits of HTML in some places, we actually want to serve them up kind of pre-baked. Uh, so we didn't want to put HTML in our SAS. So we didn't want to be, like, a lot of these, you put the HTML, like your button and your form, in your SAS file, and that's what generates it out. And we didn't want to do that just because we didn't want to have two places of truth for, for our templates. We wanted to serve up the JavaScript, the model, uh, functional, like, what happens when you click that kind of JavaScript and the template, as well as the SAS stuff. Um, and so that was kind of the biggest reason that we didn't use anything that was out there. We based a lot of what we built off of stuff that was out there. Um, but we'll see how that goes. We're not we're not at any place where that's actually being served yet. So right now, it, it what, what it does is it just builds based on, it's an Express app, and so it just builds based on the template and all the SAS stuff kind of separately. Um, so. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, I, I don't personally have quite the aversion to uh, putting the um, 
the markup right in the SAS files, but I, I've seen a lot of that. I, 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 can, I can see why people are averse to it. Well, you know, and I, I honestly think it just depends on your project. So if you're doing a lot of these style guides, what they are, I think where they've been coming from is client work, right? So if you're building like styles for a client, you want to, hey, client or designer, when you're uh, doing a new page in this, you know, here's what you can pull from, like, here's where you have all that. And so it's okay to do it that way. We are so big, and there's so many developers. There's A-B tests going on. There's, um, all, like, labs projects. There's all kinds of things. And so we don't, we want to try to eliminate as many places where that stuff lives as possible and kind of keep just, like, one single source yeah. um, of, of where, like, this is our HTML for these basic um we're calling them ingredients, but these basic patterns are ingredients. Um, this is the JavaScript, so every time there's a drop down, the JavaScript functions the same way. This is the SAS. Um, and so that was really our focus because of the type of organization and, and application we build or site that we build. But I think for a lot of people, having it in the SAS files like that is probably totally fine. Yep. One of our biggest fears was um, giving people markup and then that markup just getting like placed into a WYSIWYG or something. Because um, we currently have a lot of that kind of content where it's just markup in a WYSIWYG. <clears throat> because at that point, it's like in dozens of places, it's in dozens of different languages, and the, the time it would take to change that markup is daunting. So like that was a big goal for us, is to make sure that any markup we created that got implemented was done so programmatically, done, done, through, done so through templates you know, on the back end of Drupal and those types of things. So that was, that was a big deal for us to, to make sure that, you know, if we needed to <clears throat> change a template, we knew that there was one place in the CMS that that template was actually been implemented, and we could actually change that <laughs> versus trying to find the dozens and dozens of places that might have gotten used and maybe slightly modified and, and all those types of things. So um, that's I can see that that one-to-one -one relationship would be a huge thing if, and I know it's something we're actually kind of looking at trying to do um, of like pulling directly from Pattern Lab, like pull those files right out of Pattern Lab and then use that to serve up on the website. So that, that one place of truth is really, that's, a, that's certainly the, um, oh, what the, that's the golden standard I think we're all trying to get to. Mm -hmm. So a, a little bit more about Mortar. So you, you landed on Hologram. Um, and uh, by curiosity, are you going with... Um, did you start with just a base theme, or did you like try the Cortana theme or any of those other themes? Uh, I didn't try any of the themes. I, I'm pretty much uh, using Mortar itself to style the style guide. Gotcha. Okay. Because um, I know with uh, Cortana came with a completely different um, uh, um, menu system. So I know there's there's a lot you can do with a menu system. I, so, uh, can we can we go back to that? Can we talk about sure. using your styles to style your style guide? Mm -hmm. Can we talk about that for a second? Go for because it. Because that's something that we have not quite done, and it's been driving me nuts. And I'm just kind of curious, like how that's working out for you. Well, how? Wait, how are you doing it that you're not doing that? That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's working out fine. I mean, in a certain way, sometimes it looks a little wacky because you know, you've got these, like, giant headlines that are meant to look, you know, very important in the context of a news article, and then all of a sudden, when it's heading, you know, a section of your style guide, it looks a little ridiculous, but uh, to be honest, it's, it's, it's just not, uh, uh, that, that just seems like a very painting, painting the bike shed concern to me, to it, worry it, about that it kind of stuff. It kind of is, and so, um, Micah, that's kind of why we haven't really done too much of it because there were some styles we had like a style guide that wasn't like pulling from anywhere and so we were using that and that had some styles with it and then what we did was we broke out all the ingredients so the templates in the SAS into a separate repo so we have the container and the ingredients and um, what we wanted to do or what we want to do is have the container that serves the style guide, that actually serves the app pull the ingredients in as like a like consume them as a dependency, which is the same way that like eventually our website will actually consume just the ingredients. So the, all the container, the building of the style guide itself is not in the same repo as the ingredients. But we haven't gotten around to that part yet. Um, and like on one hand, it drives me nuts because I'm writing CSS to make my style guide work when we add like new things to it. And on the other hand, I'm like, it just doesn't matter 
as much. Like, it's not really the primary focus that, of the thing that I'm building. Um, but then it feels weird to not be using the ingredients. But then there's things in the style guide that, like a tab, we're going to do like a tabbed thing that we don't have as a pattern in ingredients. So we're going to have to have CSS anyway. Yeah, and that's, I, we just haven't. <laughs> yep. I, I definitely, I, I think I understand you a little better. I, th I thought you were trying to say something else before. Um, uh, I know one thing we were doing, we specifically had different styles for our style guide versus the patterns that we're displaying. Um, and Welch, I think you're feeding back just a little bit. Um, uh, if you just turn down a hair, because I'm coming back through. Um, uh, sorry, that's not. Uh, I want to have a separation so that when when a when a style with a chunk of, of code came through, it looked visually different than the rest of the style guide. Right. So that you could tell, okay, this is style guide around it, and this is yeah. you know, the block code in the middle. What well, um, makes sense for your style guide to match, right? Like typography styles, and that yeah. kind of stuff. You want it to match what your your actual styles for your project are, but but not be identical, so you can't tell what's. What's the header that you're displaying as a style? What's, What's yeah. the, the header? And, I, and I, I was having some problems with some conflicts of like we were serving things in and like part the ingredients were getting the container and the ingredient CSS, but the container wasn't getting the ingredients. Yep. And, um, yeah. <laughs> so well, yeah. how's that going for you? <laughs> um, well, to be honest, we haven't. We, well, you know, one thing, like I said before, uh, we don't have the luxury of, of uh, a consistent um, a consistent CMS, a consistent framework, a consistent server. Um, oh, don't worry, neither do we. <laughs> yeah, so we're we're not we're not quite into you know serving up component like web component like things yet. Uh, we have talked a little bit about doing React components for some of the things that we're doing, some of the things that kind of, kind of can stand alone. Uh, but we haven't, we haven't got, we just haven't gotten there yet. Uh, mortar, mortar is really still in its infancy, um, and it's being used to power a few things here and there. Yeah, so let's jump to that. Like, um, tell us about what mortar is and how it's being used right now at National Geographic. Um, so right now, uh, it's, you know, it was, it was kind of built as a proof of concept, um, just to show that it could be done and what it would look like, and to be kind of a collection of the things where of all of all the different kinds of styles we have, where where styles can start to get vetted and approved. Um, right now, uh, it's mainly used to prototype smaller sites um, because it has the fonts, it has the branding, it has the colors, and then it's also used. It's ingested by a few of our kind of standalone modules. Like for instance, we have a global responsive navigation that we just started rolling out. Um, and that basically ingests mortar as a power component and really doesn't use it for much. It just uses it for color variables and a few other things. Um, so, so it's a nice way to keep things in sync. So you're using Bower for that the consumption portion? Um, not exclusively, but partially. Okay. Because we were we were debating, um, I had terrible experiences using Bower. I was debating. We were de I think mostly going with npm. I was just kind of curious who else is doing that kind of consumption of styles into other applications and how they were doing you it. Talk to me about that yet, then. So I don't know. Wait. Well, we haven't had yeah. you on the podcast yet. A <laughs> good point. <laughs> um, what, what, are the, uh, what are the problems you run into? Uh, no problems. Uh, not really. We just have not quite. We're just starting to to kind of build that out. Um, and just make sure that it will work in all of the different environments that we will want to be using it in. And so mostly just kind of curious what other people are doing and what they're using. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're using using Bower for that kind of probably some similar reasons. So you can create this package of styles and assets you can push out and get adjusted in different places. Um, and one of the questions I, I had for you in note down here was you mentioned um, specific use of uh, semantic versioning. So that's the other cool thing about Bower is that you can basically create these tag releases and easily ingest those using logical, um, like give me the 0.2, you know, point whatever release. So if there's a point release, I'll pull those in. So uh, are you are you successfully using different versions of your styles in different places, different applications? Yes. Question to, okay. Both of, both of you, either, both. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for us, semantic versioning wasn't just, uh, uh, you know, the cherry on top. It's really a necessity. Like I said, you know, we've got such a diverse number of things happening uh, that really we can't have anybody just kind of pointing at latest. 
Um, you know, they really do need to kind of elect to uh, uh, to bump up a version to make sure you know that they can kind of uh, test things and make sure that there's no collisions. Yep, and it allows you to go back and do bug fixes on on an older version if need be, and and then pull those version or fixes back up into uh, upstream as well if possible. Cool. <laughs> it sounds like we have a little bit of a delay here too, so it always makes this kind of fun. Um, so um, one thing I wanted to talk about, um, I, I know I mentioned uh, kind of before the show, uh, visual regression. Um, you haven't dove into this 100%, but you said it's something you're kind of taking a look at, and how does that kind of work with the rest of, or how do you envision this working with the rest of your system? Um, I, uh, I did the visual regression, uh, visual regression testing workshop at SASConf, and it was great because it was just the excuse I needed to not only try it out, but I think we tried two or three different options, so I really got a good sampling of what, what's, what's offered. I was um, kind of bummed I didn't get to go to that one. It was a, it was a tough choice. Did, were you teaching the other workshop during that session? I, I did the refactoring one, and I think okay, it was yeah. up against... I think it was up against that one, maybe the performance one. I can't remember, but that was one of the ones I didn't get to go to, and it was, it sounded really cool. <laughs> it was very cool. Um, uh, so we, we don't have anything doing that yet, but uh, I, that is really something I would like to bring into Mortar um, to basically just do regression testing on individual components once we start to get more of those kind of component and block level pieces into Mortar. At least, I don't know if we talked about this. Are you looking at visual regression for the for the system you're building? Yeah, definitely. We um, it, it's on my list. Um, trying to figure out if the best place to do it is kind of in the the website itself. So, like, obviously, it matters there, right? If you introduce new features or anything, you want to see what the site actually looks like, um, or if we want to do it in just the ingredients, kind of in the the style guide, if you will, itself, um, or both or what that looks like or kind of like how do we integrate it into the build process. Um, we're kind of, we're still working through all those things and, and what the best way to do them is, but it's definitely on my list of things to add. Nice. Yeah, I think probably by the end of this year it's going to be on a lot more people's like yeah. got this done or at least are, are just about to do it. Yeah. Um, well, it's, I, I've done it. I've run stuff through like diffuse a couple of times just like as one-offs, um, but I haven't gotten to the place of putting it into the actual build process and having it run without me uh, doing it manually. So that's kind of the next step is to figure out where that belongs. Like how, how often do you do it? Um, where do you store that stuff? Um, Jessica Dillon gave a talk about it uh, and her, her how they ran, dealt with some of these same problems. Like where do you store the files? How often do you do it? Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at CSS Conf Oakland, which was really, really good. So just, I think a lot of people are kind of at that place of like, yes, I, I have it running. I know that I want to do this. What's the process that I can actually use this on a regular basis and get some value out of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've recently, honestly, just fallen in love with all, with all kinds of testing. Um, I got to set up Travis uh, uh, CI for continuous integration on a personal project of mine. Unfortunately, it's it's uh, moving towards that stuff in National Geographic, it takes a lot longer to get into a con continuous integration uh, cycle. We're still not there yet, but we're working toward it. Uh, but I got to do it on a personal project recently. It's like the most exciting thing ever. I love it, and I just have gone test crazy. Um, yeah, I just want to write tests for everything. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the holy grail for us is getting to that point where we can push up to a server and the entire thing gets built, the entire thing gets tested, uh, just you know, with a click of a button, you know, because at this point everything's still a bit manual. It's still dependent upon you know whatever your local environment is, because ours are just slightly different here and there. And like, really excited to get to a point where we can just any time that there is a it's a merge request, um, you know, submitted to master that just automatically runs our visual regression would be yeah. amazing. Uh, I just got a paying reminder that the guy that gave that um, visual regression testing workshop at SASConf was Kevin Lamping. He's actually here in Austin. Um, and, Micah, we should tweet that out for people. He had some really, really great slides with, like, a little example. So if you're kind of curious about that or want to play with some of the different ones, um, I'll make sure to dig up that link uh, and put it on the SAS Bytes Twitter for you guys. Definitely. Yeah, no, Kevin's an awesome guy. We I, I, Has he been on the show? He was I'm trying to recall if he's on the show, maybe even talking about No, but about we should it. invite him again. I think we probably should. 
I think he actually maybe came on because I did a series talking about uh, all of the people that were going to speak at SASConf. I think he actually came on for that for a little bit, which is kind of funny because I've completely forgotten. Um, but yeah, that'd be good to try and get him back on here as well to talk about um, what he's doing with visual regression these days because there's there's a lot to it and things are changing pretty uh, pretty quickly. I'm actually speaking of visual regression tonight, giving a, a quick talk at PDX SAS on it. So nice. um, it, it's it's a topic that's going to keep coming up, I think, yeah. over these uh, over this and, next year. And so. speaking of, um, I meant to kind of say this last time, but I couldn't make it last week, which is unfortunate. It looked like a, a great chat with, with Snook. Um, but if you are doing front end architecture stuff, if you are trying to get involved in this, or if this is something that you're actually actively doing at work, or you know somebody that, who is, who should be on the podcast, totally ping us, let us know. We would love to have you on or or any of your coworkers who are doing it. Um, open call. So just throwing that out there if you're this is if you're listening <laughs> and you do this. Is anybody out there? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well um well, uh, really excited to have you back on. I think I'm gonna be back out in DC um, at the end of April. So hopefully you're you're still out there, right? Sure. You sorry? Awesome. Not everyone's moved to Austin quite yet. Not yet. Not. I don't understand. <laughs> don't come down. Don't come down. It's almost South by. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> you, you don't need to warn me twice. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, appreciate you coming on the show today. I know um, Lisa's got to get off, and I've got a, a, a meetup to uh, schedule for tonight. So um, uh, cool to hear what you're doing with Mortar. You can actually, um, it, really cool thing, and we didn't get a chance to mention this, uh, Mortar is uh, open source. It's on GitHub, um, and you can download it and run it yourself and look at it which is very cool. It's neat to see National Geographic be willing to just to put that out there for people to see. Um, so I will push the link out to that as well. You can get a chance to see holograms, see how it works, and see what they're uh, doing with it there at National Geographic. So um, thanks again for coming by. Um, it's been, I know, a little, little bit of a wacky day, and I swear I'll pronounce National Geographic properly in the future. Thank you. I just have to enunciate every word and then it works. <laughs> so um, anything going on with you in the next, uh, any talks or meetups or stuff that you're doing here in the future that you want to uh, give a quick um, uh, shout out for? Me? Uh, so well. first thing I want to mention um, is that you mentioned that people can uh, take mortar for, for a spin. Uh, if you do actually decide to do that, uh, please feel free to hit me with any questions you have about how something works. I know a big part of my uh, workflow when I'm trying to figure something out is I really love going to look at other people and how their code works. And it, sometimes it's not uh, perfectly documented and it's hard to tell. So please, anytime, hit me up with questions. I, I love talking about this stuff. Uh, as far as announcements, I, be I believe we're bringing uh, Sassy DC back in March. Um, we're looking for speakers. Um, if anybody wants to, please get in touch with us. Awesome. Awesome. And Elise, I think uh, you've got one last thing to, yes. to say as well. Yeah, kind of unrelated. Um, so if we're if we're all done, go for it. I want to sign off with this uh, <laughs> little little preview um, for those of you who are uh, SASConf fans or following the SASConf Twitter. Um, tweet yesterday that it'll be a big announcement tomorrow. So if you're thinking about SASCOMP stuff next year, um, want to kind of see what's going on, stay tuned. Tomorrow, big news. Wait, so is tomorrow today or tomorrow? tomorrow? No, tomorrow, tomorrow. Oh, okay. Friday. I thought the tweet was yesterday, therefore... The tweet was yesterday, was tomorrow. but the big announcement on Friday. So okay, tomorrow. big announcement coming on Friday. Yeah, it should be. That's, that's tomorrow. Yes, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that should be exciting. So, Cool. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to that. We'll leave you on the uh, edge of your seat. Yes. <laughs> great. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, for coming by this week. Um, I know next week we've got a great guest lined up, uh, Ben Frain. We've been talking about a bit of his work for the last couple of weeks. So um, it'll be really neat to talk about him, um, some of his approaches. Um, and really, I want to pick his brain because... I'm I'm 100% like drinking the Kool Aid, going in the direction that he's he's going, and I uh, really want to hear more about uh, about it. So, uh, looking forward to that. Um, again, uh, thanks, Elise, for coming on and co-hosting the show with us. Thanks, Welch, for stopping by and talking to us about National Geographic and Mortar. And uh, I think I owe you a drink next time out in DC. How about that? <laughs> All right, it's gonna have to be a Shirley Temple, but thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks for having Thanks me on. Me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. We'll see everyone next week. Bye. Hopefully, I'll be completely off of this cold. So um, we'll catch you then. See you later.